So what are the differences between a cinema projector and, say, a commercial project projector, you reckon? Uh, well, there's a lot of differences. Um, you know, there's the commercial projectors that uh, a lot of companies, you know, use, say, in the production of uh, events, event hire, you know, uh, things like, uh, you know, the light shows and uh, lighting up buildings and corporate events and that sort of stuff where where commercial machines are used predominantly because it's mainly about light output and not about image or colour fidelity. And that's the main difference, I think, between uh, home theatre projectors and digital cinema projectors as opposed to commercial projectors. In digital cinema and home cinema now, we are focused on image quality, colour fidelity, uh, you know, things, things like that. And also, obviously, inputs that will handle the sources that we use at home, unlike the stuff that they're going to use in, in the commercial sense, which is laptops and, uh, you know, things like that, or, uh, you know, servers, media servers, or advertising servers that just are showing up images. You know, we're actually showing movies and uh, television, and we want those to look their absolute best. We've got projectors starting from, say, a couple of thousand to a couple of hundred thousand. Can you perhaps kind of elaborate a little bit about kind of what the differences between some of these projectors? Yeah, sure, sure, Michael. Um, technology is a big part of it. So a lot of the cheaper projectors are using, uh, say, silicon technology, uh, and some are using DLP technology. Some of that technology has been around for a long time, you know, 20-plus 20, 20 years now. And so that technology has become rather uh, commoditized and it's not that expensive. The lenses that they use, uh, a lot of the lenses and the very cheap machines are either all plastic lenses or they're a plastic hybrid lens. So they've got a little bit of glass, you know, a few glass elements, but they're mainly plastic. The bodies are often plastic. They come off production lines. They're, you know using sort of common parts and, you know, using very low-grade video processing. So as you go up in the price range, you would expect that things will get better, as in the technology gets better, uh, more expensive components, higher quality lenses, usually all glass lenses uh, that use multi-coatings. Uh, the machine could either be uh, hand-built, like Barco, uh, or could be, you know, uh, parts of it could be manufactured in... Uh, on a production line, then other bits can be hand assembled. Video uh, scaling and, and the video um, processing is very, very important part of it. So, you know, when you look at something like a Barco, they're using 12 bit video processing. They're using the largest DLP chipsets uh, that you can possibly get, almost double the size of what you get in a cheaper DLP machine. The, the lenses are absolutely superb. They're the highest grade lenses, you know, that money can buy. Uh, and these, are, these things are often very obvious to people like us who sell the product, but may not be so obvious to the consumer. Is it okay to use a projector in a, in a, a general purpose room, like a lounge room over a, a theatre room? Is there, is there at some point where you'd kind of use one, uh, or is there a projector like a Barco that can be used in kind of both environments? Yeah, ab look, yeah. absolutely. Uh, People would have heard of the term of uh, media room, which, yes. which became very popular over the last 10 years. So instead of having a dark room or a bat cave for a dedicated cinema, uh, people started to want media rooms. Media rooms became more popular. And essentially, uh, in a lot of those, they just had b the biggest TV that they could find. But a lot of people also opted for a projector and a screen. So you would have a very bright projector with what we call a, an ALR screen, an ambient light rejecting screen. So those products that are out there can be used in media rooms, lounge rooms, you know, in bedrooms, whatever you like. It's just a matter of matching the technology, having a projector that's bright enough to produce a good image and a screen that actually can perform in high ambient light areas. That technology is available. The, the, the nice thing about using projection and screens in those areas is that we can produce much bigger images than TV. Okay, at the moment TVs uh, probably peak out at about 85 inch, 
that are affordable, we can go 120, 130, 150. So bang for buck, in that scenario, a projector and screen would work very, very well in a media room. This is where LEDs and lasers come to the fore. Back in the old days, uh, which is not that long ago, but lamps and bulbs were very expensive. You know, they'd cost anywhere from $1,000 to $2,000 to replace your lamp. And you're only going to get, say, 1,000 to 2,000 hours out of that. So we used to guard our lamp life, you know, all the time. So we'd always turn the projector, watch a movie, turn the projector off, you know. Uh, and rightly so. But now with laser, uh, so laser technology, uh, and this goes for everybody, not just Barco, but uh, most people who are using lasers are quoting a minimum of 20,000 hours of life light out of that uh, particular uh, laser. And that's to a half-life, so that's to 50% brightness. The beauty of lasers is that you can actually dial down the illumination. So if you bring a laser from 100% down to 80% or 75%, you double the life of the laser. So now you're getting 40,000 hours out of a laser. LEDs are similar. LEDs give you a, a, a base of about 40,000 hours. Uh, so you can, you can use these new projectors as TVs. You know, you're talking about watching them four hours a day, every day of the week for 15 plus years, if, if you wanted to do that. So we've got amazing longevity. So yes, we can use them as TVs, use them as you know, our cinemas, whatever. Would you say picture counts for 50% of the experience on a dedicated cinema? Yes, uh, and that's not just me. George Lucas, who everyone knows, Star Wars fame and all that stuff, uh, when he first uh, decided to film Star Wars, at the, end of, at the end of the production line, he was very concerned that most of the cinemas all around the world did not have the correct audio system to support his, his magnificent movies. And he said that audio and video, uh, they're a partnership and they're 50% of the experience. So 50% of your experience is, is the fantastic images that you see. The other 50% is the audio that can actually enhance that. Um, and also just apropos of that, I think that a lot of, I think the trend recently has been that audio has been surpassing video. I don't really know the reason for that, uh, only that maybe people don't really understand that they, they work together you know, that uh, somehow you can have a bad image with really good sound and that's going to work. Well, that doesn't work. And vice versa. You can have a fantastic image with poor sound. That doesn't work either. So you've really got to get that balance right. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, the major movie directors around the world make their movies both in the realm of vision and audio and they're, they're designing something, you know, they're... they're their intent is to have all of that working together so we get the perfect immersive experience. What do you think new technologies have come about in the, in the last probably 10 years, emerging technologies in projectors and so on? Yeah, Give us sure. A a... And not just for Barco, for, for a lot of the uh, you know, projector manufacturers out there now. I suppose the main thing that we've seen, there's been two quantum leaps. Obviously HD uh, and now Ultra HD. So we're moving from... We went from 720, you know, or even 576 to 1080p. That was a massive leap. Uh, and then we've gone from 1080p to 4K. Uh, just on the resolution side, that's a massive leap. But also we've transitioned now from really lamp technology or bulb technology to LED and laser technology. Now, we can still buy lamp-based projectors. Uh, they're very cheap and at the bottom end of the range. But... LED and laser have really uh, taken projectors to the next level, mainly because we can now get fantastic brightness out of our projectors where we couldn't before. That's extremely important for HDR. And of course, we have longevity. So LEDs and lasers can last anywhere from 20,000 to 50,000 hours, where a lamp essentially would run out of puff after 1,000, maybe 2,000 hours. Uh, environmentally, lamps are very bad. They're full of lead and mercury, and then we have to get rid of them and dispose of them properly. 
LEDs and lasers, LEDs are just little light bulbs, essentially. Uh, so not a lot of uh, environmental impact there. And lasers are very similar. You know, once the laser, you, you're talking about someone buys a projector now, it will last them 20 years of viewing if, you know, if they don't upgrade it before some new technology hits the market. Sure. So I think they've been the major uh, leaps. Going, going to new, new light source technology and, of course, 4K resolution. Look, screens are very important. Uh, and look, any screen is better than no screen. Clearly, you know, I've seen instances where people just buy a projector and throw it onto a wall or throw it onto a, a bed sheet hanging up on, you know, on the wall, you know, which is just ridiculous, really. You might, a screen and projector are a system. They're, they're, they're sort of, you know, they're, they're, they, they just work together. There's no point in buying one without the other. Uh, screen technology... You know, again, this, this, this boils down to, uh, you know, the quality of the screen material, the quality of the frame, the velour. Uh, the screen material is very important because that's the luminance you're going to get uh, basically in a room. Okay, your, your projector is going to put light output onto that screen and then that's where you're going to get your light level, which is then going to produce the images that you want. So screens are, you know, I think a very important part of the mix and the other thing to remember about screens is that they last a very, very long time. Okay, people will change their projectors maybe two, three, even four times before they change their screen. So it's important to buy a good quality screen. You know, they last, if you look after them, they'll last for 20 plus years. So you're better off to say, get a really good quality screen that's gonna work well with numerous projectors over the time. So not sure if that answers the question that well, but I, you know, they're, they're as important as each other. Well, look, I think, I think the, the, the answer to, say, uh, a good projector versus a bad screen or vice versa, I, th I think the bottom line there is that a bad projector is going to give you a bad image. So no matter how good your screen is, it's not, it, you, what you're going to see is what the projector is producing. Okay, so I think a really good projector will produce a really good image. Now, a bad screen may not reproduce that image perfectly, but it's going to be better than the, than the other way around, okay? Because a poor projector is going to deliver maybe not the best colour uniformity, maybe not going to have the brightness, uh, it may be he's going to introduce artefacts, the video processing may not be as good. The, a screen doesn't affect that part of the, the, the image. That's coming from the projector. So... I suppose personally, I would buy the best projector I could, and then I'd look at what I've got left to buy the screen. But I'd also try and buy as good a screen as I possibly could, because it does make a difference. And speaking of screens, Clever, what are the recent technologies have you seen changes within screen technology in terms of materials and so on? Yeah, well, I think, I think uh, probably, I mean, these have been around for a while now, but I think one of the major uh, innovations in screen technology has been woven screens, for sure. You know, woven screens, uh, as I say, they've been around for about 10 or more years now, but probably even 15 or more years now. But, but the idea of a woven screen is that it, it helps produce better audio. In the old days, if we wanted to put speakers behind screens like they did in a commercial cinema, we'd be using perforated screens, okay? And the problem with perforated screens is there's a lot of artefacts happening with the actual uh, audio. It also affects the video, but more so the audio. So a big leap forward in that sense have been woven screens because they can be much closer to the speakers than what a perforated screen can be, uh, and they produce a better image than what the old perf screens do. Now also, perf screens have gone to microperf, so they've got much smaller holes in them now. A lot more holes, but much, much smaller holes. Uh, so again, they're a little bit better for audio, not as good as woven screens, but they produce a better image. The microperfs produce a better image than what the perforate, the old perforated screens do. So there are a few new sort of uh, technology leaps for screens. There's also things on the market like ambient light rejecting screens. Uh, people may have heard of screen innovations. Uh, they've been a real, uh, you know, uh, like leader in this field. 
they had products like Black Diamond and Slate, which basically reject light apart from the projector light. So any light coming in from the sides, the top, the bottom of the screen, basically gets rejected. So you can use those in very high ambient light areas and get a fantastic looking image on them. If you're in a dark, dedicated cinema, I wouldn't be sort of really suggesting an ambient light rejecting screen. They do, they do do some funky things in, in dark rooms, which we could go into a little bit later. But essentially, I think if you're in a dark, dedicated room, you'd be using a woven uh, or a solid screen technology, uh, you know, or even a microperf if you want to put speakers behind the screen uh, and you need a little bit more gain. Uh, yeah, so there has been a lot of, uh, you know, technological advances in screen technology. Are there common faults in installation that you've seen that uh, compromise performance in projectors and screens? Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, there's, look, I suppose the thing is there's no, there's no panacea to everything. And, and a lot of the times there have to be compromises in, in cinema design. Uh, what I probably see, there's some real common sort of uh, faults that often people do. And, and number one is probably having like seats up against the back wall. You know, that's just a number, just a no, no, you know, because there's a lot of base energy coming off the back wall. That's actually where, you know, the base frequencies are hitting the back wall and then coming back from there. So I see a lot of cinemas where they've got the root, the, the seats shoved up right up the back of the, the wall. And it's, it's just not good. That, that's not a good experience for anybody because all the client is going to hear is just boom and bass. Um, another probably uh, thing that I think people do wrong is, uh, not enough subwoofers in the room, you know. Uh, bass is the hardest thing for us to control in any environment. Uh, and people have the wrong idea about, oh, if I put more subs in, I'm going to get more bass. That's not necessarily the point of more subwoofers. A single subwoofer is very hard to control and you get a lot of nodes in the room. You add another bass woofer, it doesn't necessarily give you, you know, more volume of bass, it just smooths out the base in the room. It helps to eliminate a lot of the nodes. So I think with design, I think a minimum of two subwoofers for today's cinemas is a must. And of course, putting in four subwoofers even helps that again. So yeah, more subwoofers, the better at the end of the day. My, my biggest pet peeve, I have two pet peeves. Number one is mismatch systems. And we, we, we touched on that before with, you know, 50-50, you know. So what would you consider to be a mismatch yeah. system? Obviously? Well, I've been to a lot of installations where the guys spent, you know, um, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars on a speaker system, and he's got a nine point four point six speaker system, and he's got a three thousand dollar LCD projector up on the ceiling, you know, with a hundred and ten inch sixteen nine screen. I mean, I just want to pull my hair out. I feel sorry for the client. He's been sold an absolute dog, you know, because there's no way that that image is going to match the sound performance. So it's just it's, it's just the completely wrong thing to do. And vice versa. I've been into jobs where someone's put in a $50,000 projector and put a whole bunch of cheap ceiling speakers in the ceiling with a, a cheap AVR. And again, I think, well, the client's been sold a dog. You know, that's just, you cannot... I wouldn't even sit in that room, you know, because it would just be wrong, you know, that the sound would just not match the image quality that they're getting. So that that's one of my major peeves is that people mismatch the 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 equipment. The other peeve is I feel sorry for clients who get undersold, particularly when they can afford the best. But I often see consultants and salespeople selling to their own pocket. So they're more worried about discounting product or offering cheaper product to a client who is really has different expectations. So I think that there's got to be more, you've got to consult with your customers more. You've got to find out what their expectations are, what they want to use the room for. You know, what are they hoping to achieve? You know, not rather than just trying to discuss a budget and fill that up with product, you know. And again, so often I go into people's houses where, 
they've got a very, they're in a multi-million dollar house and they've got a very, very average home cinema system. And I think, wow, you know, you've, and, and they're saying, oh, we don't use that because, you know, it's, it's not very good or the kids don't like it or whatever. And you think, wow, you've spent all that money, yet you didn't get what you wanted. So I think that you've really got to find out what your client wants and then, you know, sell to that aspiration, you know, because uh, all you're doing is letting everybody down. If the client's not getting what they expected, it doesn't matter how much money they've spent or how much money you've saved them, they're not going to use that room. And that's a terrible thing. You know, you really need to, we all need to work on that and deliver, you know, sort of the best, the best possible outcome for our clients.